It's mid-February 2024 and it's a grey, misly day with a chill in the air. I thought that the weather was beginning to perk up a bit, but February always takes me by surprise. Just when you think the worst is over, another cold snap appears or a bout of wild and windy rain. There's an old saying that whatever the weather is like on Candlemas, it will do the opposite for the rest of winter. If Candlemas Day be fair and bright, winter will have another fight. If Candlemas Day brings cloud and rain, winter won't come back again. Unfortunately, Candlemas Day was fair and bright, so we may expect a bit more winter yet. Despite the weather, I've come out for a walk anyway, because there are still lots of things to appreciate, like clumps of snowdrops hiding at the base of trees and bright birdsong against the bare grey skies. There are plenty of lovely walks around our village to take advantage of, and today I've come past the new vineyard and down to the village recreation ground. I've paused to sit for a moment, and I can hear children playing in the playground, enjoying the afternoon with no care for the bad weather. It got me thinking about how simple things like the sounds of life can so easily be twisted into something frightening if your imagination allows you to make the leap. Often the most effective scary stories aren't those which take us to the realms of fantasy, but use the mundane to find the sinister. There's a dark undercurrent to most things if you start to scratch away at the surface. With that thought in mind, don't look too searchingly in the rearview mirror of your car when you're driving down a deserted country lane late at night. And when you get back to safety, gather close around the fire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens Podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to the 37th episode of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm telling off a flock of wild geese for ravaging my vegetable garden and trying to persuade my co-host Martin Vaux not to bake them in a pie. You honking varmint! Speaks off my turnips so it's the pie for you! Martin and I have had quite a week of celebrations, which has been a pleasant balm to the absolutely foul weather. Outside, rain has been lashing the windows, but inside, we've been enjoying the delights of Fat Tuesday and Valentine's Day with <laughs> feasting and merrymaking. I actually hadn't heard the term Fat Tuesday applied to Shrove Tuesday or Pancake Day until last week, but I have wholeheartedly adopted it and did my level best to live up to the name by flipping bushels worth of pancakes. I can confirm he did, and <laughs> also that I ate them. And listener, they were delicious. <laughs> did you celebrate Shrove Tuesday before heading into a period of Lenten abstinence? Tell us your favourite pancake filling on social media in all the usual places. Facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast and X at Three Ravens Pod. It's difficult to choose a favourite, actually. I mean, it's hard to beat the classic lemon and sugar, but there are so many excellent combinations. Speaking of excellent things, we have some amazing new Patreon subscribers to thank this week. Welcome to The Conspiracy of Ravens to Celine, Janie, Gemma, Nicole and Dan, who is a Kentish man rather than than a man of Kent. Oh, Very important distinction. Yeah, uh -huh. And thank you so much for flying into our cosy folktale lined nest. All hail Celine, King of Patreon. All hail Janie, King of Patreon. All hail Gemma, King of Patreon. All hail Nicole, King of Patreon. All hail Dan, King of Patreon. And if you'd like to join the fun on Patreon, please head over to patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. For either $3 a month or $6 a month, you'll have access to ad free episodes episodes and all of our exclusive content, including our new episode and story all about the legend of the White Stag. And next week we have our Three Ravens Film Club episode about 1984's The Company of Wolves. 
If you've watched the film and you'd like to send us your thoughts, please email them over to threeravenspodcast at gmail.com or tag us on social media. That address is also the place to send us your thoughts and tales of your adventures. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk correspondence more fully at the end of the episode. Now, before we get stuck in, I'd just like to remind everyone that our Folky Flash Fiction competition is ending in a couple of weeks to coincide with the end of the series. So if you'd like to send us up to a thousand words of original writing, please do so by then. We've had lots of brilliant entries, so it's going to be really hard to judge them all and pick our favourites. But we're certainly going to have a great time reading them all after the end of series three. So we're releasing this episode on Monday the 19th of February, which means that we're out of the excesses of Shrovetide and well into Lent. Mm. Martin and I don't generally give up anything for Lent, (laughs) but historically the 40-day period before Easter has been a time to fast, pray and abstain from luxuries. People often give up sweet foods, drinking or other pleasures, and sometimes it's customary to donate the money you might have spent on enjoying yourself to charity or the church. Yeah, which is all very virtuous, but it doesn't sound very fun, does it, Eleanor? It doesn't at all, which is probably why the Jack-O-Lent was invented. Yes, we've talked about Jack-O-Lent before, haven't we? Basically, it's a figure you create from straw or something equally flammable, which you can kick and abuse and throw things at throughout the month of Lent, presumably to relieve your feelings after all that fasting. That's right. (laughs) Jack-O-Lent, in an addition to being a convenient target for Lenten rage, may have also been intended to represent Judas Iscariot or even the figure of winter, which had to be destroyed to herald in the spring. Yeah, we didn't make one last year, but this year I'm determined to fashion myself a little punching doll. (laughs) Are you allowed to if you don't actually give anything up for Lent? I think so. I think it could be a handy thing to have on my desk for example, to be honest. Annoying email? Take that, (laughs) Jack-O-Lent! If you're making a Jack-O-Lent this year, we'd love to see them. Please tag us on social media or if you're part of the Three Ravens podcast group on Facebook, put your pictures in there. We want to see those Jacks before or after a good kicking. (laughs) So aside from the season of Lent beginning, do we have anything else to celebrate today? Well, a little bit. I mean, it's the commemoration day of various extremely obscure Catholic saints. Excellent. Here's a few. (laughs) And yes, I have picked ones with names which amuse me. St. Cumiano of Bobbio. What? St. Barbatus of Benevento, Ooh. who dealt with a heathen religion which worshipped a golden viper Whoa. by melting down the effigy of the viper and turning it into an altar chalice. Cool. And of course, St. Conrad of Piacenza, known for various miracles involving severally healing cakes and fluttering birds. Well, it sounds like a busy chap and he had range, didn't he? OK, well, with that, should we get the county criers to ring us into Staffordshire? Look, you lot, you're meant to kick the jack lent not each other. Stop it! Staffordshire is located in the West Midlands. It's bordered by Leicestershire and Derbyshire to the east, Warwickshire to the southeast, Worcestershire to the south, Shropshire to the west, and Cheshire to the northwest. It's totally landlocked, and the county town is Stafford, although the largest settlement is Stoke on Trent. As ever, you can find a map showing Staffordshire's location in England on the blog at threeravenspodcast.com, along with pictures and links to things we'll talk about in the episode. Martin, do you have any associations with Staffordshire? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I'm pretty sure I've never been there, although so often in Three Ravens we think we haven't been to places, and then it turns out we actually have. Otherwise, the only thing I can think of is Staffordshire dogs? Yes, of course. Yeah. Staffordshire does indeed have its own breed of dog, the very adorable Staffordshire Bull Terrier, mm. a short-haired and muscular purebred terrier. I've got to tell you, Martin, it was a real struggle for me not to include a dog <laughs> in this week's story, given this very important fact of Staffordshire Bull Terriers, but I have managed well, it. This shows admirable personal growth, Eleanor, although it's worth saying that while Eleanor was doing her research for this episode, she very regularly could be heard going, oh, because she'd found another picture of a Staffordshire Bull Terrier puppy (laughs) on the internet. Now, I have a slightly greater association with Staffordshire as I wrote a short play for Stoke-on-Trent's new Vic Theatre's Horde Festival, which commemorated the discovery of the Staffordshire Horde in 2009. Ah, yes, I have heard of the Staffordshire Horde. That was like a huge haul of Saxon treasure, basically, wasn't it? 
Yes, that's right. And I was lucky enough to see it when it was displayed at Birmingham Museum. It's an absolutely amazing find. The largest Anglo-Saxon hoard ever discovered. Whoa. It features over 4,000 items and fragments dating from the 6th and 7th centuries. And it was discovered in a field near Lichfield. Incredible. Well, I'm definitely going to be looking that up. And, and you know, you went to see it. Did you have a favourite piece within the hoard? There are some incredible cell work, sword fittings and hilts. But my favourite item is a huge gold cross, which has been bent and folded out of shape. Ooh, intriguing. Do we know why it was bent? Because of of course, we've heard before about sort of ceremonial bending and breaking of things, but a cross doesn't seem like the thing you'd want to bend. We don't know, although there are a number of theories. It may have been simply to make it smaller for burying, <laughs> okay. or perhaps to prize it from the front of a book of Gospels oh, where it may yeah, have been yeah. fixed. It might also, as you say, have been deliberately folded to kill its power, mm -hmm. as we talked about in the case of bent pins before, either by pagans who wanted to remove its spiritual properties or perhaps even by Christians who might have wanted to deconsecrate it before burying it. Yeah. So the list goes on, really. It does. Of course, people also sometimes believe that if they bent and broke things, then they would be available to people in the afterlife as mm. well. So perhaps it was a way of somebody taking that cross with them. But gold is quite soft, so um, perhaps it was just bent by accident. Yeah, I like we, the idea that they wanted though. to make it fit and just sort of jammed it. In yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, though, I didn't know much about Staffordshire either. Although I did discover that the county is home to Wedgwood, the fine china manufacturers. Yes, we actually have some Wedgwood pieces, don't we? Yes, we do. Oh. The company makes all sorts of pottery, but became very famous for its distinctive, colourful jasper ware with white relief decorations. It has a particular feel to it, Wedgwood, China, as it's dry bodied rather than smooth glade. So yeah. it feels kind of rough if you stroke your finger across it. The company was established by Josiah Wedgwood in the 18th century and it became an extremely successful pottery business. Wedgwood even bought a large estate at the outskirts of Stoke-on-Trent for his pottery activities, which he named Etruria after the Italian Etruscan people who were famed for the craftspeople. And the area around there is still called Etruria to this day. Well, that's so interesting. And he was such an interesting man, I must say. Lots of uh, combination of family members between the Darwin family and the Wedgwood family, actually. They were, like, really politically active. I've always wanted to get my hands on black Wedgwood pottery, though. I think it's quite rare, but looks so cool! Some of the more unusual colours are quite difficult to get hold of now, but the most popular is the distinctive cerulean blue known as Wedgwood blue. That's well, the kind well, you'll see most often. Yeah, so I'm going to imagine Staffordshire is very proud of Wedgwood as a son. So, does the flag feature a Wedgwood vase or something? It does not, yeah. sadly. <laughs> it actually features a Staffordshire knot, which is a simple three-looped overhand knot. It originates from an Anglian stone cross, which has been dated to about 805 and can still be seen in Stoke Churchyard today. Right. And this knot is engraved on that cross. Christianity probably arrived in Staffordshire in the great Lindisfarne Crusade in the 7th century. Yeah. But it's possible that the knot symbol actually predates the arrival of the Irish monks and might be a Mercian symbol. OK, so I'm guessing it's that part of the country to make it part of Mercia. Yeah, it certainly was. And the Mercians hung on to it grimly too, despite being frequently bothered by the Danes uh. and indeed harried by Canute in 1016. <laughs> Get off, Canute! Stop it! <laughs> Stop harrying us! <laughs> Stafford itself was a fortified burr, which became the centre of the Shire. And it had a great strategic placement due to its position on the River Trent and actually became the capital of Mercia. Whoa, so hold on. Was this Pender's homestead? Not Pender. This uh. happened much later under Ethelflaed, who was the eldest daughter of Alfred the Great. And she was Queen of Mercia from 870 to 918. Hey, that sounds quite unusual. A queen in the ninth century, a female ruler at that point in time. Yeah, it was quite a unique event, actually. She was married to a guy called Athered, who was uh, the king. And after his illness and death, she just carried on rolling. Good and for her. Did it pretty 
pretty well to all reports. In 917, her armies actually captured Derby, which was one of the five boroughs of the Dane law and a Danish stronghold. Awesome. So Ethelfleet just got the Danes. And this, this capture of Derby apparently freaked out the Danes in Leicester, another one of the five boroughs, yeah. so much that they just surrendered to Ethelfleet without a fight. Whoa. And she was about to subject York to the business end of her war acts as well, but she sadly died before finishing the job. She sounds amazing. I think so. Oh, I'm sad that I'd never heard of her before, but I also feel like she needs to be the subject of some kind of book or film or extended TV drama. Yeah, I agree. She was really efficient as a ruler. She was responsible for loads of fortification, including at Bremsburg, Bridge North and Tamworth. And obviously, she wasn't afraid of no Danes. <laughs> I would definitely like to see a film of Ethelfleet's life. Come on, Netflix. What about pre-Saxon, though? I mean, were there Romans? in Staffordshire? I imagine there were. They got everywhere, those Romans. Yeah, they were in Staffordshire. They established a fortress at Leto Satum, and some of the settlements still remains today. It was originally a military settlement, but gradually became a civilian town with bathhouses and mansions. Yeah, classic Roman strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of mansiones. Other camps have also been found in the same area near the junction of Watling Street and Icknield Street, the Roman roads. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, there is evidence of early British habitation too, and lots of Iron Age artefacts have been found. Oh, I'm always impressed when I hear about Romans and what they accomplished, and indeed the Danes. You know, the fact that they got to completely landlocked areas of Britain with their naughty conquering ways. They've got a lot of dedication, these people, to invade and establish something so impressive and keep contributing and building these towns. On the subject of naughty conquering ways, yeah. your old pal Billy the Conqueror also managed to get there. Of course he did. And his harrying of Staffordshire was complete and brutal. Oh dear, orcs. Literally no English <laughs> estate holders were allowed to keep their lands. And at the time of the Doomsday Survey, the county was quite poor and sparsely populated. There were only 2.8 people per square mile in Staffordshire in 1086. Wow, that is not many people. It's really not very many people. Makes you wonder how many people there were before Billy the Cogs came in and was like, you look useless, chop. You look useless, chop, and just didn't stop. (laughs) However, a number of medieval towns grew up in the later Middle Ages, many of which included deaneries, so it was Tamworth, Tutbury, Lichfield, and Staffordshire was kind of starting to get itself on the map a little bit until the Barons Wars during the reign of Henry III. Most of Staffordshire's nobility supported Simon de Montfort, Mm. which saw the county being ravaged again by Prince Edward. Oh, dear. Seems as though Staffordshire picked the wrong side in that particular conflict. How about the Civil War? Any better? Right side, but not to great effect. Uh. While Staffordshire was largely parliamentarian, the Royalist forces managed to garrison Stafford, Lichfield and Tamworth, even sieging Lichfield Cathedral in 1643. Oh, wow. Okay, does that mean that Lichfield Cathedral is full of bullet holes? Because sometimes you do encounter these Civil War bullet holes. I was hoping you'd tell me we had some nice intact cathedral and castles in Staffordshire. Oh, we do. Lichfield Cathedral is still amazing, even if it did sustain quite a bit of damage during the Civil War. Cool. All the stained glass was destroyed. Yeah. Uh, so most of the glass in the building is is post-Civil War. And they didn't do what they did in Winchester, which is keep all the bits and then just randomly reassemble them later. No, they've got some <laughs> older glass in, in one of the chapels, I think, but most of the glass that was shot out has been replaced completely. Mm. But it is still quite breathtaking. It's one of three cathedrals in England with three spires. Whoa. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. And it's also home to the Lichfield Gospels, which you might also know as the Book of Chad, which date from the 8th century. You don't think of Chad as being an ancient name, do you? You don't, but <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Just, yeah, hi, I'm Chad. I, uh, it seems wrong to me. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke and Chad. Yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the ruins of Croxton Abbey, which was once a surprisingly elaborate Cistercian Abbey. And Stoke Minster, the church of St. Peter Ad Vincula in Stoke-on-Trent. There's been a church on the site there since 670. And you can still see bits of the Anglo-Saxon church there. Wow. As well as the graves of two great pottery pioneers, Josiah 
Josiah Wedgwood and also Josiah Spode. Oh, wait. So does Spode pottery also come from Staffordshire? It does. And the two ah. Josiahs actually work together a bit, although Spode is credited with improving the formula for bone china and Spode pottery is more likely to be glazed than Wedgwood. And when we say that he improved the formula for bone china, could we say that, Ellen, Ellen, could we say that he cracked it? Could we, could we say that? Should I we? will not Sh- dignify that should we? with a response. Should we say and we'll that? instead give you some informative facts about the castles of Staffordshire, <laughs> oh, okay. of yeah. which there are several. <laughs> None inspire terrible puns. Well, that's a pity. I thought I was really kiln it. Martin. Kiln it. No. Martin, no. No. Okay. Well, surely I've earned your respect by now. Earned it. Should I take pot? Like Staffordshire is rich in castles, like. from Stafford Castle, which dates from the conquest, to Tutbury Castle, a mostly ruined medieval castle, where <laughs> Eleanor of Aquitaine once stayed, I'll have you know. Oh, yeah. There's also a cute little folly, Mocop Castle, Hamworth Castle too, actually the chief residence of Offa. Oh, the, really? The of the Dyke. Oh, cool. But the Vikings sadly reduced it to blackened ruins until Ethelfleet rebuilt it. This Ethelfleet? She was on it, honestly. Yeah, she was. Infrastructure was her middle name. As ever, we'll put pictures up on the blog so you can have a virtual tour of all these lovely places. Martin, have you stopped making pottery puns now? I have, at least temporarily, but I have been wondering about something else. Oh, yes. Okay, last week you promised you'd talk about a piece of Staffordshire history, which has intrigued me since you mentioned it. You said there was a cheese riot. Oh, yes, the flour and cheese riot of 1783. Now, I'm picturing absolute bedlam with melted brie flooding down the streets and drowning people, huge explosions of flour mushrooming over the rooftops as desperate people throw stilton at each other and grapple for the last piece of Wensleydale. (laughs) Dark visions of the future, maybe, but the actual event disrupted the pleasant lands of Etruria, where Wedgwood pottery was peacefully being made until... The day a canal boat laden with cheese stopped at the wharf at Etruria. People were really struggling at this point. Unemployment was high and people were quite hungry. And the cheese was actually intended for the people of the Etruria potteries. But then the boat's owner changed his mind as he thought he could get a better price in Manchester. So he redirected the boat. But by that point, a ravenous, cheese-hungry crowd had gathered <laughs> and were determined to lay claim to the cheese they considered rightfully theirs. Oh, no. Absolute chaos ensued. Wedgwood himself, along with some local magistrates, had to be summoned to quell the riot. Unfortunately, the man who started the riot, Stephen Barlow, became something of a cheese martyr. <laughs> cheese martyr? It's not funny. What? <laughs> because he was charged with inciting the riot and causing damage to property and subsequently hanged. Oh, he was hanged? He oh, was hanged. dear, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, I had for a moment a sort of vision of him being crucified on a very large cracker. <laughs> but, um, hey. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now... I can't wait to start sharing Staffordshire's fascinating folklore with you. Not least because our first guest is an actual Three Ravens first. Really? Surely we've had every sort of mad and mysterious folkloric creature by now. No, today we're welcoming for the very first time. Look, there he is, cantering up to us, all terrifying. A headless horseman. Oh, you're right. We actually haven't had a headless horseman before. And who is this particular headless horseman? Well, he haunts Butterton Moor and the roads around Butterton, Leek and Warslow. And his origin story does vary a bit. Yeah, he can't explain to us because obviously he's missing No head, missing exactly. The, head, yeah. uh, the, the talking bit isn't, mm. isn't there. But some suggest that he is a murderer who was beheaded for his crimes and who's riding around searching for his executioner. Right. Wherever he came from originally, he has a horse and no head and encounters with him usually result in death or bad luck. Well, he can't see where he's going, so he's going to trample right over you. He's, he's relying entirely on the horse to guide and the direction of travel. that's never a good idea, No. Well, a drunk farmer who was on his way home from the pub accidentally asked the headless horseman for a lift and didn't realise until he'd climbed onto the horse. Oh, no. Um, I don't know how he didn't realise, but he didn't realise. At which point, he had the worst horse ride of all time. <laughs> Dangerous riding personified. That's what happens when you leave directions in the hands of a horse. Oh. He was so shaken up by the ride, though, that he died died a few days later. Well, it sounds to me like the Headless Horseman was just trying to be helpful. Are you sure that this poor Headless Horseman isn't just getting really bad press? Well, other accounts of seeing him usually feature 
either a person or an animal dropping dead. Oh, right. So I think after a certain number of coincidental deaths, it starts looking a little bit suspicious. Yeah, fair enough. Let's hop on the back of the headless man's horse anyway, and let him gallop us around Staffordshire's other mysterious (laughs) sites. All right. So if we ride down towards Etruria and the Potteries, we might encounter Sauntering Ned. Presumably he'll be easy to overtake as he only saunters. Sauntering Ned will be easy to identify from the strange animal which accompanies him. Oh, yeah. It's actually only a donkey, but okay. Ned has attached a chain to its back legs to Whoa. make a scary dragging sound and fashioned a strange headpiece with horns for the donkey to wear. So is this a ghost? No. Oh, this what is, is just, it then? This is just the story of a person. Oh, a man called a Ned. donkey. Who only sauntered because he'd chained up his donkey. Yes. And the reason he decided to dress his donkey up is because he travelled the road alone at night to yeah. sell pots and bowls. And he was a bit fearful of walking alone at night and being robbed by ne'er-do-wells and such sure. like. So the peculiarly disguised donkey was a sort of attempt to deter robbers. Well, so he was trying to make a sinister sound with his donkey. And put a, a weird hat on it to make it appear like a monster. What? <laughs> but it actually paid off because really? once when Ned had stopped for a rest at the village of Bucknell, his terrifying donkey with its rattling and yeah. strange silhouettes scared off two grave robbers who were raiding the churchyard and mistook the donkey for the devil coming to take their souls for their bad behaviour. Excellent. So we've collected a headless horseman and a flashily dressed donkey. I mean, where are we riding to on their backs? Well, we can call at the Potteries of Etruria for another addition to our animal menagerie as if the rattling donkey wasn't enough. Excellent. We could add a mysterious pure white rabbit which appeared in the woodland planted by Josiah Wedgwood which was known as Etruria Grove before it was built over. Oh, it's been built over. That's a shame. It has been built over. But before the rabbit was seen, passers-by would hear the voice of a young boy calling for help, and then the rabbit would run across their path. Nobody was ever able to catch the rabbit, and there's a story about some locals having a go, and it being so difficult that one of them actually dislocated his shoulder while lunging for the rabbit. Okay, so it's a sneaky rabbit, but does it have a child's voice once? Going on. Yeah, there's a rather dark legend about it that it's the spirit of a young boy who worked at the potteries who was accidentally killed in a fight with another boy. Right. But panicking, the, the killer boy strung up the body from a tree, hoping it would look like suicide so yeah. he wouldn't be blamed. But he was caught in the act, which actually made him seem much guiltier oh, no. than he was with yeah, the simple accidental killing. Nobody really knows what the connection with the rabbit is, but it's said that this... <laughs> voice of the boy in distress is heard before the rabbit is seen. No connection at all. But there's a white rabbit and a dead boy. Why not just smush them together into this one legend? the boy's voice as well. Oh, yeah. It was two for the price of one, I guess. Um, but you said the woods aren't there anymore. No, they're not there now. So I'm assuming that there's houses there now. And you'd certainly get a shock if you were, like, watching TV one evening or, like, hanging the laundry in the garden. And suddenly a ghostly white rabbit runs across and goes... Hello, I'm a little boy. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I think I'd move. Did you know I was hanged <laughs> after I'd been murdered? Instead, <laughs> let's gallop away. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> to Rushton, to the Church of St. Lawrence the Martyr, for another slightly grim story. Oh. And it's funny you should say that. Did you know I'd been hanged after I'd been murdered? Yeah. Because we're going to hear about poor Thomas Meakin, who was buried alive. Oh my goodness, the people of Staffordshire are savages. I really don't like how often you get these stories of buried alive people, and it keeps cropping up as we travel around the country. Like, I feel like everybody should have just taken much more care to make sure that the people they were burying were actually dead. You would think so, wouldn't you? But there's every chance that in the case of poor Thomas, it was very intentional. Wait, what? So they deliberately buried him alive? Mm. Oh, no. I mean, was he really annoying? Because if he was really annoying, then, like, if everyone had said, Thomas, (laughs) if you don't stop doing that, mate, I'm going to bury you alive and he just carried you know or whatever it was he just kept on doing like nasty people <laughs> it sadly sadly was nothing like that oh, right. i don't think thomas deserved this this foul fate at all uh, <laughs> okay. he hadn't been making annoying noises all right so why lip. did they bury him well then? thomas had been a delivery boy and he was a well-known figure around rushton he often delivered for a local apothecary and soon a romance 
sprung up between Thomas and the apothecary's daughter. Nice, good work, Thomas. But the apothecary was not too happy about this. And one day, the people of Rushton were shocked to hear about the sudden death and extremely hasty burial of Thomas Meakin. No. Still, nobody thought that much of it until Thomas's pony was discovered a few days later, pouring at the soil over his grave and trying to dig it up. Oh, good pony. The pony was shooed away, but it kept returning to the grave until the locals decided there was maybe something a bit fishy going on and that they'd, they'd better exhume Thomas and yeah. have a little look. All a bit grisly, but when they dug him up, they discovered Thomas dead, but with cracked fingernails from scrabbling at his coffin, trying to get out, and that, he's left scratch uh, marks a horrible. on the wood. I mean, that kind of thing is actual nightmare fuel for me. Like, I'm not very good in enclosed spaces. I'm not very good with heights either. In fact, I'm just not very good at going anywhere like you know stay at home it's nice and safe <laughs> and visit good open spaces where there are no ghosts <laughs> well the apothecary was never accused um because i guess you know figure in the local community of good standing yeah. they weren't gonna say anything and thomas got buried again although his gravestone which you can see today doesn't say his date of death just his date of burial as nobody can be sure exactly when he died after that being is buried. So awful. So it was oh, he was interred yeah. 16th July, but it doesn't say when he died. Oh my goodness, that is so dark. And it, again, it's another one of those examples of in the past, you know, people kind of murdering one another and the community just going, Yeah, it's fine. No, it's <laughs> only Thomas. I <laughs> think the detail about the pony is particularly poignant. Yeah. There's a sort of grey fries bobby note to the story there, this faithful animal at its master's grave. Okay, I'm getting indigestion from the uh, extended metaphor of us riding behind this headless horseman, Eleanor. But still, where are we cantering off to next? We are off to Doxy Pool, a small pool situated above the Roaches, which is an escarpment of strangely shaped rocks. Right. Doxy Pool is said to be the home of Jenny Greenteeth. Now, I'm going to obviously make a joke uh, related to the current UK dentistry crisis, but quite a famous figure of English folklore, Jenny Greenteeth. Yes, she's a malevolent water spirit or a grindylo who's supposed to be blue in colour and lures unsuspecting people into a watery grave. Yes. She crops up in various places across the UK, but this particular pool is associated with Jenny Greenteeth mm. or Jenny Greenteeth. She's also um, a bit of a close cousin of another less than friendly water monster from Staffordshire, the Mermaid of Morridge, who is said to live in Blakemere on the Leek to Buxton Road. So is this an evil mermaid, this one? Um, yes, it's a slightly unpleasant mermaid who yeah. lives in this pool. She's quite unusual for a mermaid because the lake is completely inland, Blakemere, yeah. so, and it's only about 50 metres wide. So the mermaid has not reached the lake from the sea mm. and has possibly never been in the sea. Supposedly, this lake, which is also known by the rather sinister name of the Black Pool, Ooh. doesn't bode too well, does it? No. It's said to be so scary that birds won't fly over it and cattle won't drink from it. Well, if there's a mermaid inside it who's going to drag them under and eat them, yeah, understandably so. Well, several people have drowned in there and a murder victim was dumped there in 1676 as well. Well, no, I can't imagine anywhere called the Black Pool is going to have terribly good vibes or a good reputation for from the outset, Jenny Greenteeth, scary, scary. But all of these kind of folk characters, I think, are all about basically the danger of the waterline, aren't they? They're like, be careful because there's currents. Absolutely, here. and this is, you know, it's a, a deep lake where you could definitely drown. Mm. Anyway, the Black Pool, this inauspicious body of water, is home to this evil mermaid who swims to the surface at midnight to lure single men to their deaths in the water. Ruh -ruh. So I'd be okay. But if you travelled there alone, you wouldn't be. No, I'm obviously going to go anywhere with you. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah you'll, I'll be be fine. you'll be fine if I'm there. Oh, she, she, if it's a couple, though, she just pops up and goes, Oh, hello, have a lovely evening. Yeah, have a nice evening on, on your way, jog on. Stories about this mermaid's motives and where she came from vary, but it could be that she was brought back from her home in the sea by a sailor who fell in love with her and wanted to bring her to a sort of local pond. So oh, yeah, kind of to... trapped her there. Yeah, and mm. she never forgave him for kidnapping her. 
So now she attacks lone men. Dark. Or another story says that she was a witch who was drowned in the pool in the Middle Ages and transformed into a mermaid to take her revenge on the Whoa, people who drowned her. That's a cool origin story. And you know, speaking of witches, how is Staffordshire's witch game? Is it strong? It's pretty strong. We've got Molly Lee from Burslem, a witch whose legend persists today. So in the graveyard of St. John the Baptist's church in Burslem, there is an unusual 18th century grave, which is turned around to face north to south. Ooh. It's the only one in the graveyard like this. And it belongs to Molly Lee, a woman who died in 1746. Is this just because Molly Lee liked to be different? She was like, no, please bury me the wrong way around, everyone. No, not at all. It's actually quite sad, I think, because um, she was supposedly a strange kind of distant person who'd never really had any friends. And even from young childhood, she'd always been followed by a jackdaw. Whoa. So she had this bird as a pet from a very yeah. young age. And she kept to herself. There was a bit of rumours about her, but she didn't attend church. So the local vicar wasn't too impressed. No, fair enough. So he confronted her, which didn't make Molly Lee too happy. Yeah, it never does. Funny that. The priest then committed further atrocities by trying to shoot Molly's pet jackdaw. Oh, what? Yeah, not okay. No. But it didn't work out too well for him because he then developed terrible pains and had to spend a few weeks in bed while the bird was fine and just flew away. Yeah. So the priest then accused Molly of witchcraft. I've got to be honest, the guy was lucky she didn't sick the jackdaw on him. Take his eyes, Molly. Take his <laughs> eyes. Fortunately, Molly just died of natural causes before she had to stand trial for witchcraft. Yeah. And thus she was buried in consecrated ground in the church because nobody had actually convicted her of anything. I see. But then the priest, after she'd been buried, started to see Molly Lee wandering around. <laughs> or certainly thought he did anyway. Yeah. And the jackdaw was still around, flying around the graveyard. So the priest had Molly's grave opened up and he drove a stake through her heart to prevent her ever returning again. Oh my goodness. Rather hideously, he also caught the jackdaw and buried it alive in Molly's grave Blimey. as he believed it was a devilish familiar. And then the gravestone was turned around so it was sort of, it feels a little bit like Molly was being othered even in her death. Yeah, my goodness. I mean, that sort of collected and added together feels very much like the persecution of a lonely bird lady at the hands of a slightly insane, power-hungry priest. Yeah, not a very happy chapter in history. Mm. And if we visited her grave on Halloween night, we could try to tempt her spirit out by running around the grave three times and singing Molly Lee, Molly Lee, chase me round the apple tree. Ooh. Molly Lee, Molly Lee, you can't catch me. Oh my God, I feel really spooked out by now. Now look at them, my hairs on my arms have all stood up. That's kind of Bloody Mary-ish, isn't it? Mm. You know, the the whole is. look in the mirror, repeat Bloody Mary. But no, no, definitely not going to try that. There's another Staffordshire witch operating around the area of Ronal who was apparently quite a cross patch. He was always cursing crops and things like that. Okay. Apparently, she took great umbrage when the local squire wanted to plant crops on a piece of land which had been intended as common land. Right, yeah. And she, she cursed the land to always grow the best possible crops. Right. So the land grew the best possible crops and yeah. they were taller than all of the other crops and lasher and, you know, much, much nicer. But every time on the night before they were due to be harvested, they would all rot. Oh. So she's like, look what my piece of land can do and then make them rot before they could be harvested. Dark. Yeah. So when this local squire had had enough of the crops being cursed, he burned her cottage down. <laughs> <laughs> in revenge. A proportional response, right? But she cursed him to die a horrible death and then vanished never to be heard of again. Then we get the curious part, as if mad, yeah. madly growing crops were not <laughs> so was, curious. It's already pretty weird. Yeah. This squire was out farming in the field when suddenly he felt a bit strange mm. and then he fell down dead. Mm. His corpse would never stiffen with rigor mortis. <laughs> <laughs> Not even when he came to be put into his coffin. He <laughs> remained flopsy. Um, but the really strange part is that the grass where he'd fallen in the field was all withered and it wouldn't recover. And when a new tenant took over the squire's farm, he died in exactly the same spot. Whoa! And his body didn't achieve rigor mortis either. Oh my goodness. This happened a third time with a, a new tenant. A third time? And the grass was always withered. 
Could it have been something to do with the witch? I don't know, but uh, it seems quite likely. It does. It seems like she maybe laid a kind of magical landmine that just kept going off. Keep gift that kept giving. Yeah, the detail about the lack of rigor mortis is a bit strange. Do you think people just didn't like their squires? very much so sort of hastily buried them before checking they were actually dead well it's quite <laughs> likely with the first squire Captain yeah. Powis as well as burning the witch's cottage he was also the person who gave the order to fire on the rioting chartists in Burslem in 1842 wow okay um, chartism if you're not familiar is a political movement for social reform it was particularly concerning the rights of working class people basically in the 19th century it had a great stronghold of support in the Staffordshire Potter and the black country okay yeah, it was really yeah, yeah, yeah popular yeah. movement from around here where we're talking about as most of the chartists proposed reforms were later adopted i think we can conclude that captain powis was definitely the bad guy in this whole situation quite creepy about the patch of withered grass though on the subject of creepy things do we have many ghost stories from Staffordshire? Oh, yes and one of them is actually going to be the subject of my story for today awesome but here is a ghost story that sort of isn't a ghost story right and actually we have heard variations of this one from other counties so i'm starting to wonder if there's much truth to any of them or if they're a little bit like doomed love affairs between monks and nuns that result in brickings up and forever haunting yeah sure this sure. <laughs> one is based around chance hall in eckershall and features a wealthy woman dying and asking to be buried with a particular ring on her finger. Mm-hmm. A greedy coachman spies the ring, and after the funeral, he breaks into her vault to try and steal it. We have heard a similar version of this in a few other counties, haven't we? But he we? can't get it off her cold, dead finger, mm-hmm. of course, so he decides to get out his little fruit knife and cut that finger off. Classic. But as soon as he cuts it off, a huge gout of blood spurts up into his face, and the corpse sits up, screaming her head off. Yep. The coachman flees with the finger but it's all right because the lady wasn't dead after all so she climbs out of her coffin and staggers back home with her bleeding hand (laughs) terrifying her poor husband half to death because he thinks he's seen a mutilated ghost but then everything's explained and they live a long and happy albeit fingerless life together yeah i mean variants of that one do crop up all over the place although I do always wonder about, you know, the wife staggering home to the husband and find him shacked up with her sister or something. You well, know? in this instance, this poor chap was just in bed and then <laughs> looked out of the window to see his ghastly blood-stained <laughs> wife tapping, going, let me in, I'm cold, Dory. <laughs> <laughs> Staffordshire is um, not short of magical places either. There's a holy well at Ashenhurst, which is known as the Egg Well mm-hmm. because of its elliptical shape, which is potentially Roman in origin and certainly has a mysterious Latin motto inscribed on it, reading Renibus et spleen cordi gerorice meditur mille malis prodest ista salubris aqua. Yeah, you're going to have to translate that for me. Well, it's been translated a few different ways, but it probably means something along the lines of Whatever the liver, reins, spleen, heart endure, a thousand ills, this wholesome spring can cure. Well, that sounds like an extremely useful spring then. I think one has to have a holy well, really. Yeah. You know, any self-respecting county can have a holy well. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. A headless horseman's door, which has a horse I'm still flogging, (laughs) might also (laughs) take us to not one, but two potential inspirations for the location of the mythical Green Chapel in the 14th century chivalric romance Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Wait, what? That's surely not a real place. Like, surely it was just a made-up thing for the story. Well, the dialect the poem is written in actually matches the dialect spoken on the Staffordshire-Cheshire border at the time of writing. Okay. So it's fair conjecture that the writer may have been inspired by some local sites. The two potential sources are Ludd's Church, which is a secret underground chasm only lit by sunlight once a year on Midsummer Day. What? It's deep in the depths of Back Forest. It's amazing. That sounds incredible. Yeah, I'll put some pictures on the blog because it's very atmospheric. It was also apparently a meeting place when it wasn't okay to be a Protestant. Right, with you, with you. (laughs) That sounds just absolutely sensational and absolutely magical as well. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Goodness. The other potential location is a cavern named Hobhurst's house, which apparently belongs to a goblin of this name. Yes, only a few episodes ago I was talking about another cavern called... 
called Hobhurst House? Well, it's the same Hobhurst. Yeah. He has lots of caverns. Mm. Apparently he was a bit of a second, third, fourth home goblin. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Interestingly, this particular one was featured in the film of Bram Stoker's The Lair of the White Worm, which we've well, talked about before, yeah, of but that, course. that cavern was in the film. Wow, both of those sound amazing. I must certainly be stopping points on Headless Horseman Tours, which I think now has to be a business, actually. <laughs> Something else we might see on Headless Horseman Tours yes. is, of course, the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance, which we talked about in the autumn mm-hmm. when it's held every year. But it's considered to be one of the oldest Morris dances in England and still uses the original antlers, some of which are over a thousand years old and come from reindeer. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. And we actually did have some exchanges on Facebook with members of the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance. I'd love to go and see it in real life. Oh, Maybe shout this out to autumn. them. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> perhaps this autumn. Now, I thought it had been a while since I'd included any local folk magic in an episode. Yeah, we created a whole spin-off so that you could just have a show where you did that. <laughs> yes, but I, I thought it might be nice to, to have some today. <laughs> so, it, for it. example, if we find ourselves in any trouble while riding with our headless horses. <laughs> oh, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Well, mm. I've got some practical solutions. <laughs> so if we get in a bit of a cough, which seems quite likely if we're engaging in wild horse riding in the winter, yeah. we could wear a necklace of peppercorns and some hair cut from a donkey his back in a silk bag around our necks. Sounds horrid. <laughs> well, something to be stylish. It was meant to sort out your cough. Okay. But if we get a toothache, we might like to consider catching a mole, cutting off its paws no. while it's still alive, no. and then whichever side your aching tooth is on, you carry that paw in your pocket. Oh, well, so if you've got a bad tooth on the left, it's the left mole's hor- paw. And you Ellen, put that no, in your pocket. this is horrible. Poor moles. I'm not cutting any moles' little hands off. Well, Ugh. in these difficult times for dentistry, the moles <laughs> better watch out. That's all I say. <laughs> Burrow deeper, little moles. Escape from Eleanor. She's <laughs> after your hands. Anyway, I have one burning question yet to be answered, Eleanor. Yes. Why on earth were you trying to stop me putting geese into pies at the beginning of this episode? Oh, well, I was referring to the legend of St. Werber. Right. Who you might remember because I have a brooch depicting this very miracle. Oh, yeah, you do. I mean, her name obviously sounds like she's sort of the patron saint of dubstep, Werber. <laughs> Well, Warba, possibly the patron saint of dubstep, yes. was a niece of Pender of Mercia, actually. But she was a Christian and established various monasteries, including one at Trentham and one at Hanbury. Mm. Unfortunately, her monasteries were bothered by villainous <laughs> geese yes. who ate all the vegetables and the corn in the kitchen garden. St. Werber was very patient with these geese and called them all to her preached the good word to them and also asked them very nicely to leave the gardens alone. Yep. And the geese faithfully promised, <laughs> honking away. But two of the monastery gardeners hadn't quite got the memo and caught two of the geese and baked them in a pie. Understandably so. The next day, the gardens were ruined again. So Werber got the geese together again with a deeply disappointed look on her face and said, <laughs> what on earth are you playing at? You know, we had this chat. And the geese honked crossly and pointed out that two of their sisters had been put in a pie just after they'd promised to be good forever. <laughs> so Werber sent <laughs> the gardeners and the pie and she got the geese all to gather round and then everybody prayed together. And the two geese in the pie came back to life. I, I like that the, there's a happy ending that also involves geese that had been turned into pie meat were made whole again and reformed and revived. Well, it's a miracle. Martin. Yes, I suppose. Yeah. And it has a happy ending because uh, <laughs> Werber wouldn't allow any geese to be cooked in the monastery ever again. And the geese agreed to let the gardens alone. Both sides lived in peace. Yeah, I mean, it's just like South Africa or something, isn't it? You know, peace, the end of apartheid. No pies, no, no ravaged gardens. <laughs> Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. It's Off all stage, relieved honks. She's like the Nelson Mandela of her day. It's such a silly story but i'm not sorry i asked about it thank you for telling me (laughs) now it's time for my story so make yourself a quick cup of something hot and comforting to go with it it's called the children of canic chase and i'll start spinning my yarn right after this rain rattled against the windscreen too heavy and fast for the wipers to clear they left wide smears in their wake making it almost impossible to see through. Lily crawled the patrol car down the deserted lane, unable to go any faster. 
If she had to give chase, she'd be putting herself at risk, especially as the road was littered with broken-edged potholes which would bounce the car and make the suspension shudder. She shouldn't be out on her own. They weren't ever supposed to be, but they were always understaffed, and the chief superintendent had called them all in to explain that the budget cuts meant there might be occasions when the second officer would actually be at the other end of the radio and not in the car. Budget cuts were all very well, but they didn't account for officers' shift patterns, which meant more often than not, Lily was left alone. This was the graveyard shift in more ways than one, slowly zigzagging her way around the narrow lanes, crisscrossing Canuck Chase Forest, headlights dipped, watching for anything, really. Cars exhibiting any unusual behaviour, don't stop everyone, the chief inspector had stressed, or any sign of strange activity at the edges of the forest, don't go into the forest alone at night. So far, Lily hadn't seen a single car, and the trees were so thickly clustered at the edges of the dark forest that she would have been hard-pressed to spot any kind of activity, strange or otherwise. It was dangerous, being alone, and if there was any trouble, Lily was under strict instructions to call for backup immediately. Patrick's patrol was in Milford, so he could screech down to Cannock Chase quickly enough if Lily needed him, or she could go to him. Actually, Lily had volunteered for the Cannock Chase patrol. It was Friday night, and she didn't much fancy being verbally abused or vomited on outside the walkabout in Litchfield. Besides, she'd made sergeant last year, and the drunk's rescue service was for junior constables. She would much rather be here despite the dreary dark night and the lashing rain. And yet she didn't think she was doing much good. She felt in that instinctual lower gut way which had got her into hot water in the past that Cannock Chase Forest was the place. They hadn't had the resources to comb through it without a single solid piece of evidence. But Lily was sure that if they'd had a couple of dog units and an uninterrupted week, they would find something. After all, both bodies had been found in ditches surrounding the forest, although on different sides. The first, Caroline Blackwater, had been discovered at the side of the A51, and the second, Alba Johnson, near the golf club on the Rudgley Road. DCI Harris said there was no evidence, but as far as Lily was concerned, the forest had to be the key. Where else would the killer have been able to do the things he'd done without somebody seeing or hearing? She rolled down the window, peering into the dark forest. There had to be something. She had to find something. For those poor little girls. To stop there ever being any others. She knew in the deep part of herself which throbbed with self-loathing in the middle of the night when she couldn't sleep for thinking about it, that there would be another one, because they hadn't caught him yet. When they'd found Caroline, everyone hoped that it would be a one-off, but Alba's body with the exact same injuries had proved them wrong. Lily slammed on the brakes, jarring her lower back and making the car's underside grind along the road, because she could see a child reflected in the wing mirror standing at the edge of the forest. How had she driven past her? The girl must have only just emerged. Lily couldn't quite make her out through the rain, but she could see that she was wearing something white, like a nightdress. The brake lights shining on her made it appear doused in red. Lily leapt from the car, leaving the engine running, and made her way back down the lane towards the girl. Hello, she called. Police, it's all right, I'm here to help. The rain buffeted Lily, soaking her face and hands and getting under her hat. She squinted, but she couldn't see the child anymore. Had she gone back into the forest? Surely she wouldn't have done. She'd look small, only about six or seven years old, Lily thought, though she'd only seen her for a moment. Police, she called again. Please step forward if you can, I'm here to help. Don't go into the forest alone at night. 
the chief inspector's words came back to her just as she was about to step off the road and into the oozing black mud of Cannock Chase. He'd spoken to Lily particularly, giving her a look which said he knew that she would if she thought it necessary. She'd been on the receiving end of his rage and almost had a caution for going herring off doing her own thing, contrary to orders. She'd caught the woman running a drug ring out of the back of her chain of nail salons, though, so the telling off hadn't been too heated. Lily shone her torch into the woods, but she could see nothing except trees and vegetation. Then she put her foot on something and swore softly when it gave way with a wet crunch. Shining the torch down, she saw that she'd trodden on the rain-soaked, half-rotten carcass of a deer. There was a spot of blood on its cream front, and the back legs were broken. She wiped her shoe on the verge and went back to the car, shutting the doors and flipping the central locking. Her hands were shaking. 10.45, she said into the radio. Deer carcass on the Slitting Mill Road, over. How many too late nights had she had to think a dead deer was a little girl needing help? Too many, and far too many on this case alone. When was her next day off? This time, Lily told herself, she would actually use her day off to rest, instead of trying to clean the flat, do the shopping, get a haircut and catch up with four old friends. Her radio buzzed, making her jump. 10.99, wanted, a beer, a smoke and an umbrella please, over. Patrick's cheery voice came out of the radio in Lily's lap. She smiled because they weren't meant to use the radios for unofficial chat and reached for her phone to call him instead. There was no signal in Cannock Chase Forest but she could call him over Wi-Fi. How's it going? she asked when he picked up. Dull as my cousin's stag do, Patrick said. You know, the one where we all had to stand around and watch him practice his golf swings. You? Nothing much, Lily said. Thought I saw something, but it turned out to be roadkill. I should be so lucky. Are you going crazy in the forest by yourself, Lil? Maybe, Lily said. She liked Patrick a lot. She definitely didn't approve of workplace romances. They were cops, for goodness sake. They had to be realistic. But his voice over the phone was comforting, and his face across a briefing room always made Lily slightly less interested in what was being said and slightly more inclined to think about asking him out for a drink. They chatted for a while longer, Patrick telling her about the thrilling sights and sounds of the Milford Industrial Estate he'd stopped to eat his sandwich at. There was nothing really to share, but having the moment of human contact was something. When they hung up, Lily pulled away and began the slow, circular route again, driving at a snail's pace through the rain, trying to keep her eyes peeled for any sign of life. The second child was in the centre of Post Office Lane, right in Lily's rearview mirror. She must have stepped into the road just as Lily drove past. There were two of them, Lily saw as she jerked on the handbrake and brought the car to a stop. One of them was very small, and she was half hidden behind the other. Lily reached for the radio, but a sudden blinding stab of pain flashed through her head and sinuses. White spots swam in front of her eyes. She tried to focus, looking at the steering wheel, her hands, anything, but her vision was blurring. In the mirror, she could see the two children coming towards the car. Something about the slow purposeful way they were walking made Lily hesitate before unlocking the doors. Her head hurt and her breath was coming in shallow pants as it did before she was going to be sick. What was wrong with her? Had she forgotten to eat something before she'd come out on patrol? It was a feeling like fear, she realised. A loud noise echoed through the car. One of the children, the taller one, had slammed her hands against the back window. Shaking, Lily picked up her radio. 1078, need assistance. Can it chase patrol? Over, she said. She felt jittery, out of control, even though she was a trained officer and these were only two children. Where were they? She couldn't see them in the mirror anymore. Lily craned around in her seat to look out of the back window, but the children weren't there. 
When she turned back around, her head feeling as though a pickaxe had been driven into it between her eyes, one of the children was right outside the driver's window. Afterwards, it would be difficult for Lily to put into words the feeling of intense, all-consuming fear which gripped her. The little girl's eyes were black, treacherous black ice on a frozen road in a chalk white face. She was only small. She barely came up over the edge of the car door, so Lily couldn't see if she was smiling or in distress. All she could see were those black eyes drilling into her. Lily squeezed her eyes shut, then almost screamed when her radio buzzed. Lil, come in. Are you okay? Over. It was Patrick's voice. Slowly, Lily opened her eyes. She couldn't see the little girl next to her window anymore, and there was no sign of the other one. She picked up the radio. Yeah, I I started feeling ill, she said. Migraine or something, I think. Uh, I might need to come off shift. Over. Give me a minute to clear it and I'll come down there. Over, he said. Okay. Lily made herself drink some water. What was wrong with her? Why was her heart pounding and her palms sweaty and where had this sudden piercing headache come from? And why was she seeing children? And she was fairly sure there were no children there to see. There was something happening here tonight but Lily had no idea what it was. The pain in her head made her less inclined to find out than usual. She pulled away, torturously slowly, the rhythmic sway of the windscreen wipers sounding loud as a pneumatic drill in her throbbing head. The last child was standing by the junction of Pentridge Bank and Birch's Valley. She was the smallest, and she waved at Lily. Like the others, her face was white as chalk and she was wearing a pale dress which looked as though it was made of the same flimsy nylon as Lily's grandmother's dressing gowns, the kind that was used a long time ago. Her eyes were almost completely black from edge to edge. Lily rolled the car right up to the child and wound the window down. A headache was almost blinding. Will you take me home? The little girl said. I need a lift. Of course, sweetheart, Lily said, even though the child was barely dressed despite the freezing night. There was some quality in her black eyes which made Lily unable to look away from them. It was as though she was falling into those eyes and drowning in tar. Get in the back and I'll take you. Where's home? She unlocked the back doors so the girl could climb into the car. A radio buzzed again. Lil, I'm on my way, Patrick said. Are you okay? What's your position? Don't drive anymore, okay? Wait, I'll talk to you in a minute, Lily said and cut the channel. The little girl had climbed into the patrol car. With her came a damp smell, like soil and leaf mulch and something older and darker. The sharp scent of something which never should have been there. Her black eyes met Lily's in the rearview mirror. It's not far, the little girl said, pointing down the Birch's Valley Road. That way. Despite the stabbing pain behind her eyes, Lily put her headlights up and turned the car down Birch's Valley. I'm Sergeant Shaw. What's your name? Where have you been tonight, sweetheart? She asked the girl. Why aren't you at home now? I got lost, the girl said, almost dreamily, not really answering Lily's questions. I got lost, but it's time to go home now. Lily drove along the lane, until the black-eyed girl suddenly said, Here! The entrance to the track was almost invisible, but closer inspection showed Lily the broken pieces of a rusty five-bar gate, half hidden behind overgrown brambles. It might have been the entrance to a farm. It was thickly lined with trees, creating a kind of black, leafy tunnel. This is your home? Lily said doubtfully. The child answered by opening the car door and scrambling out. 
She stood next to the car a little way from it, as though she was waiting for Lily. Lily killed the engine and got out. You were looking, the little girl said, and the expression on her face suddenly made her look much older. You were looking, and now you'll find. Lily took a step towards her, meeting her impossibly black eyes, but just like that, the child simply and suddenly was not there. Lily would never be able to explain the sensation adequately. There was no lurch of the world on its axis, no ripple of change, no rush of tiny feet or rustle of the bushes. The little black-eyed girl simply ceased to exist. Lily looked down the narrow track, and she knew what she had to do. The headache had lifted, curiously, as though it had never been there. Lily grabbed the radio from the car, called in her position, and asked for backup again. Lily, what's going on? Patrick's distorted voice crackled across the channel. Just get here, she said, clipping the radio to her jacket. Then she made her way down the narrow track, not daring to use her torch in case it gave her away. Now the painful haze behind her eyes had lifted, she felt no fear not even a little. There was just an extraordinary sense of clarity that she'd been brought here by those children, whoever they might be, to do a job. You were looking, and now you'll find. The track was long, and Lily almost missed the point where it veered off sharply as the turning was covered with thick brambles. Not caring that she scratched her hands, she pulled them aside. Just beyond, in a little clearing, there was a corrugated iron shed. It looked shabby, abandoned, like a farm outbuilding which had been long forgotten. There were no lights inside, and there was a shining new padlock on its door. Lily ignored the door and picked up a piece of wet wood to smash the window. It was a single pane of glass and broke easily. Then she heard a voice. Help me! Please help me! I want to go home. Her hand now steadier than it had ever been, Lily clicked on her torch and shone it through the window. She saw the little girl on the floor first, dressed in a dirty blue tracksuit. She was terrified and shivering violently, but she looked as though she was in one piece. The smell hit Lily next, that old smell of fear and suffering. There were dark patches on the floor which might have been urine or might have been blood. And on the walls. Lily did not linger over long on those photographs. Pictures which belonged locked away in an evidence room or in the heart of a bonfire. She'd seen enough to make the call. The girl's mother had only just reported her missing. It had only been a few short hours. When the armed response unit arrived and cut the padlock, the girl rushed into Lily's waiting arms. Patrick arrived soon after, and the three sat in his car together drinking lukewarm tea while forensics moved in. They caught the man not long after, coming on foot to that little shed in the forest where he'd murdered Caroline Blackwater and Alba Johnson. He'd looked like anyone, DCI Harris said. Just another dog walker. But Lily had caught sight of him as they brought him into the station, and she thought she would have known what he was and what he'd done. It was his eyes, she thought. They were strangely blank, as though he'd been thinking of nothing at all when he'd killed those children. And they were far more horrible than the black eyes of the children of Cannock Chase. Lily never drove the forest beat again. But she never heard of anybody seeing the little girls with their dark eyes either. She didn't know entirely what she had seen that night, but she knew it had stopped at least one other child being hurt. Afterwards, all she would ever say was that she'd been in the right place at the right time, and that was all anybody could get out of her. So 
Hi, Martin. What did you think of the creepy children of Cannock Chase? I am disturbed. I'm Eleanor. so sorry. <laughs> Deeply disturbed. That was a very unsettling, very atmospheric story. But also it's made all the more sinister because I kind of know that it's like loosely based on pieces of truth. Uh, yes, it is. Um, I don't know what just stood out to me about this rather upsetting tale this week. But um, yeah, it is uh, the sighting of the black eyed children around Cannock Chase Forest is the sort of ghost story folklore part. Yeah. But... It's one of the theories for who these ghostly kids are is that they're the ghosts of very real murder victims who who were killed in that area in the 1960s. And a bit of an injustice around their murders as well. Yeah, that's right. Although um, multiple children were killed, a, a five, five children died, but I think the killer was only convicted for one of the murders. Dreadful. And then ever since, there's been these black-eyed children. Yeah, there's been myths about these black-eyed children and um, cited i think you know someone first reported seeing them in the 80s yeah so about 20 years after the the events of the crime and so i just my, my story's set right now but i figured they were still active yeah, well i mean there's been reports of people trying to follow them deeper and deeper into the woods isn't there and, and then losing yes, track although why you would want to i cannot possibly think because the feelings that my police ca- um, officer character had are the feelings that people have described when yeah. they've seen these children like feeling intense fear feeling nauseated and headachey and that, that pain behind their eyes and stuff and, and being unable to move. Also lots of accounts of people driving and seeing them in the rear view mm-hmm. mirror, seeing them in the rain. And apparently these children will try and get into cars. <laughs> like they, they will ask for a lift and try and get into cars. If so you see them, Which is quite scary. And that is scary. And it actually scared me quite a lot, which was why I decided to give the children a benevolent Yes, um, okay. <laughs> right. uh, yes, I mean, they seemed creepy, but they were just trying to help. Yeah, okay. They just, well, they just wanted her to solve the crime. <laughs> I would say if you are venturing around Canuck Chase and you do encounter these black-eyed children, maybe don't give them a lift, I, I would suggest. Because uh, no, uh, they're terrifying. They make people feel sick and give them headaches. And yeah, I don't know. They seem like a genuinely alarming phenomenon. But then, you know, if they're the ghosts of people who've died violently, maybe they're frightened as well. Maybe they just want to figure things out. Yeah, maybe they do. But then it's always said that the ghost of a child is never what it appears to be. So no, that's true. Yeah. Ugh, it's such a horror movie trope, isn't it? You know, the dark road, the white figure in the road or at the side of the road yeah spotted in the mirror but i think it's a great instinct that you had to want to play detective to solve this awful tragedy i mean there's an instinct in you which i think's really honorable and, and good and positive and i think it's interesting that we can connect the birth of the detective story and the crime story to the 19th century when spiritualism was really kicking off yeah, and just that getting to the bottom of it, what does it mean? Yes. And if we can talk to the dead, perhaps they can help us solve a crime. Mm, fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Eleanor. Are you ready to talk correspondence? Yes. Okay, well, the first thing to say is thank you very much to Raven Dark and Fat Climber for your lovely comments on Spotify. If you, dear listener, listen to us on Spotify, you can comment on any episode and we'll publish those comments right on through. So do please share your thoughts. Which episodes did they like? Well, my Derbyshire story, the creepy story in that one was a hit. So more creepiness is on its way. And also the Valentine's special, which seems to have gone down rather well. Yes, thank you to Pete and Fiona as well for your kind comments about the Valentine's Day special. Pete said he thought it was one of our most fun and interesting which is really nice. And Fiona, who's also a reverend, she's a Chaucer fan. Thanks Fiona, so glad you enjoyed it. We also had a new review this week. Yep, this one is on iTunes. It's from Rogue Pest who wrote, this is a great podcast with enthusiastic hosts who devote a lot of time and information into each episode. Now that's very nice. Thanks Rogue Pest. I do think we're enthusiastic. Yeah. And yes, we also dedicate a lot of time to each episode. <laughs> Rogue Pest, we appreciate you. Thank you. Rogue Pest also said at the end of their review that they were still waiting on the Lincolnshire episode and must have written their review just before the Lincolnshire episode came out. 
very much hope that you are happy with it, Rogue Pest. I tried my best. As always, though, if you do have five minutes, please hop onto iTunes and Apple Podcasts to write us a review. We will read it out and it genuinely will help other people find Three Ravens. Yes, please do write us reviews and wherever you listen to us, go on, drop us some stars, give us a thumbs up, let other people know we're all right, aren't we? We're all right. Come, hang out, listen to some folklore and some stories with your old pals Eleanor and Martin. Three Ravens community for life. Baby, <laughs> grunk, grunk. <laughs> we also had a lovely message from Josephine at Anna Maya Jewelry, who said, Love listening to your podcast when I'm making jewelry, thinking of using some of the interesting things talked about as inspiration for some rings or a pendant. Oh, that sounds very exciting. I would love to see if you do end up making anything inspired by something from the podcast. I have to say, it makes us so, so happy when we hear about the things people make and do while they're listening to Three Ravens. Oh, yeah. Our pals, the Knitted Bookworm and Crafty Octopus on Instagram are always making beautiful things while they listen and it warms the heart. It really does. And we've had some very nice emails. For example, Christy emailed to say, Hello, Eleanor and Martin. I'm a long-time listener, first-time writer. I live on Coast Salish land, just north of Seattle, and have family ties to Yorkshire. First, let me say how much I enjoy the podcast. Thanks, Christy. Yes, thanks, Christy. She says, I gobble up every episode as soon as it drops, and I'm now going back and re-listening to the earlier episodes while I wait. Since I'm a Pacific Northwesterner, I especially enjoyed the recent Sasquatch episode. I do have two small corrections, however. Spokane is how I said the city's name. Christy says it's pronounced Spoke Anne, as in Queen Anne. Well, I never would have guessed that. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, she also says British Columbia is very much geographically, culturally and historically part of the Pacific Northwest, but it's a Canadian province. Ah. Thanks again for your lovely podcast and all the hard work and dedication you clearly put into it. I'm humming the theme song to myself now as I head back to Somerset. Oh, that's very nice and also very helpful. Thank you. We always yes. enjoy getting correct pronunciations because mm-hmm. most of the time we just take wild punts and hope for the best. <laughs> and word on the theme song, Ben and I have finally made the time to work on a full version of the song. So that should be coming out to listen to very soon, assuming I can hit those high notes. <laughs> We're inclined to release it once the podcast hits 150,000 downloads. We thought that would be nice. Which isn't that far off. Very exciting times. We also had a wonderful message from Sharon who wrote to say so inspired by your episode on witch bottles i made one which is now buried in the floor by the back door of our new extension no bad witches have troubled us so far it seems to be 100 percent effective and she sent a picture oh my goodness that's insanely cool she says it contains rusty nails and pins rock salt a red ribbon topped up with that most essential ingredient of witch bottles, Uh then sealed with black wax. She also wrote Banish Evil from This House on top, and she and her partner paid extra attention to their intention in making and placing it too. She says it's become a talking point. Sharon, you're amazing, (laughs) and I hope your extension is protected forever. If anyone else has made a witch bottle for the protection of their home, we want to hear about it absolutely love that in terms of our likers commenters and super sharers this week special thank yous to tim andrea jody laura and john on facebook enya pirate morgan tales from the tangled wood nigel and green man images on instagram and joseph stewart georgia dark crow princess and granny moon on twitter please do come and gronk with us on social media share posts comment and tag us in your folky doings via facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast instagram at three ravens podcast and twitter at three ravens pod and if you aren't already on it do stick your beak into the three ravens podcast group on facebook yes lovely things happening on there from podcast royalty king david crowther from the history of england podcast popping by to share details of his trip to rutland thank you david to awesome videos from sabrina paco sharing top podcast recommendations and all sorts of other delights kind of wild to think it eleanor but we are getting very close to the end of series three yes our first lap around england's 39 historic counties is almost complete one more episode Mm. each and it's your last Something Wicked of the series on Thursday, isn't it? It is. It's all about Gilles de Ray, the 13th century Britonic knight and ally of Joan of Arc, who became the Marshal of the French Army while also being a mass-scale child murderer. That sounds suitably horrid, but also excellent multitasking. Yeah, I mean, he was a nasty person. It's a tale of heresy, 
priest punching and much more besides quite a juicy one and after that it's my last episode of the series next monday we're headed to hertfordshire home of the legendary outlaw jacko legs jacko legs yep you heard me jacko legs plus the dragon slaying devil evading hero piers shonks tons of ghost stories and i'm telling the awesome tale of the blind fiddler of antsy fantastic i shall tune my violin ready to <laughs> dance with jacko legs until <laughs> Well then, while our story's gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. Thanks and credit go to North Staffordshire Myths and Legends by Fred Lee, the red-haired Stokey blog and Staffordshire Folk Tales by The Journeyman. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour and our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down, derry, 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 down, down